Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vals and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 70, yeah, 70 episodes, imagine that. We're going to continue to talk about how to achieve great sound with digital sources. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Last week we talked about the importance of sourcing records that have an all analog chain of production. So, early presses, first presses if you can find them. People call those OGs, but personally I prefer first press. And as close to the master tapes as you can get. This week we're going to talk digital. Now, I was already an audiophile in 1982 when the first CD was introduced. And remember, anxiously waiting to hear the first ever broadcast of a CD on air in my home city of Ottawa at the time. And remembering back, I really wasn't in love with the sound then or now. However, a well-produced Red Book CD that's just a CD that meets all the specs required by the inventor, Philips and Sony, can sound very good, but never great. And the reason for that is the digital technology back in 1982 was just not up to the task of high resolution. Today, high resolution 196 24-bit PCM is the standard for digital music. PCM just stands for pulse code modulation, and that's what all CDs are encoded with, just at a lower resolution. Almost right away, Philips and Sony realized the need for higher resolution, and Sony wanted a way to digitize the huge library of master tapes that they had acquired. Back in the 80s, Sony went on this huge buying spree. They bought movie studios and their back catalogs. They bought recording studios and their back catalogs. And they knew the tapes weren't going to last forever. So as a result, they invested, they invented DSD, Direct Stream Digital. And in 1999, it was introduced to the public as the SACD, or Super Audio CD. DSD is a completely different digital format than PCM. Both can have extremely high resolution. Both can sound very good. But in my experience, DSD is the better sounding of the two but not by a huge margin. Let's take a look at some of these props. This is a very good live recording on CD by an iconic Canadian um, recording artist, Ian Tyson, a great recording artist is what I wanted to say. He started off as Ian and Sylvia as a duo back in the 60s in the folk era and morphed into a rancher and a C&W artist um, and a ballad, balladeer extraordinaire. Uh, and there's n no artist more Canadian than Ian Tyson. And later in life, uh, he did this, he did a series of sets uh, uh, called Live at Longview. And I believe they were recorded in, um, in his local town. They're done in a, in a hall, and the acoustics are just absolutely wonderful. At the time of the recording, the musicians with him must have been playing with him for decades because they were right on the money. And that night, or those nights that they made the recordings, they were on top of their game. And Ian's voice, which has been deteriorating over the years, uh, uh, that night he was also superb. But more importantly, I think the recording engineer realized there was going to be a convergence of, of great music that night in a great sounding hall and pulled out all the stops and made a very good quality recording. This is about as good as a live CD can sound. This is completely different. This is from a friend of mine who's a brilliant um, musician. It's just a little private thing he did at home. The artwork is beautiful. It's all handcrafted. 
Uh, the duo is called Witchwood. Look at what he, he titled the album, Songs of Love and Death. <laughs> that's, that's Tim. And um, anyways, it's just recorded in a little cafe before a live audience. Somebody probably put um, their iPhone on a, on a table near the musicians and it sounds like it. it's just a terrible recording but i love i love the music and this is a treasure that i'll keep forever a lot of cds being produced today are being done you know better quality than this probably but being done in home studios so even though the um the cd and the essay cd are essentially dead formats they're continuing to to live on now, the just just for those that I don't have an SACD here, but a SACD looks exactly like a CD, but there's a different layer encoded. So many of them are dual layered. So there'll be a CD layer and an SACD layer, and a CD player can only play CDs, but an SACD player can often play. Isn't that beautiful? Can often play both layers. Last up is my digital music player. Now, DMPs normally are meant for commuters. Uh, you know, you're on the bus and you want to shut out the noise, so you put some tunes on or you're off for a jog. This was never meant for that. It's just way too big, it's way too heavy. But um, what this gives us is basically, think of this as a miniature base station. The um, and the, the this is an ostle and con con cube before I forget, and the con cube plays DSD natively, and the reason why I'm mentioning that is 99% of all DACs it doesn't matter how good they are, how much you paid for it, they normally take DSD and convert it to PCM before they go into analog. This plays natively, so it goes straight from DST to the DAC to analog, which is what you want. A short signal path, no extra layer of conversion. Okay, now the bad news. Almost all PCM and DSD recordings available today are sourced from low-res analog master tapes. And worse, many of them have been poorly remastered. It's not until recently that we finally start to see high quality resolution recordings being made completely in the digital domain. Now, the first digital studio recording, all digital, was made, I think, in 1978. And I think that was Ry Cooter, if I remember right. By 1982, most recording studios had switched over to digital. And Philips, in partnership with um, a UK label, I forget, was it, was it EMI or DECA? I forget which one. I think it was DECA. Most of those recordings are classical. But what they did was they, they invented the digital recording studio equipment that they needed. And unfortunately, it wasn't widely adopted by the industry. That, those digital recordings made in the early 80s are fabulous. The rest of the industry, those recordings are awful. Most of them are really not good at all, unfortunately. And a lot of the early conversions from analog to digital are not very good. There are, of course, exceptions to that. So, and worse, in many cases, if you listen to high-res PCM or DSD files, there's a very good chance that they were mastered from the same file used to make the CD. So it's not surprising m m much of the high-res digital music sounds basically like a CD, and that includes upsampled files. A lot of what is sold to you as a high-res music file is in fact starting out as a low-res master file, and it's just upsampled. There's supposed to be some gain in doing that, but honestly, I, I can't see how that would be much of a benefit. So, as with analog records, 
we need to take the time to source the best digital version of the music that you're interested in. Some of the quality streaming services offer access to digital versions of the master tape. Now, how awesome is that? And that's this is what it boils down to with any music format that you're going to play. You need to find the highest resolution, best version you can, whether it's a record, whether it's a CD, an SACD, or a digital file. That I spent, as an audiophile, I spent a lot of time sourcing the best versions of the music I love. So what's happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, lots. Let's just clear off the toys, the treasures. <laughs> Okay, so the first Yuri test builder is nearing completion and he's had no problems, not reporting any problems, but he's had some minor issues with material quantities. So as I get those reported from test builders, I revise my, um, my pull inventory list. And of course, later kits that go out have those minor issues solved. We're not talking about actually missing stuff. I'm just a little tight on some things. Some, some lengths of heat shrink and wire are just a little bit too close. And one of the things I don't want to do is have a kit builder wondering if they need to, you know, think about layout with the wire carefully because they're running out. There should always be a little bit extra of everything. And Charles and I are hard at work at four, yep, four prototype kit amps. Now, they're not all going to make it to be production kits, but some of them will be. The um, And one of them is going to definitely be a phono preamp. We actually have a prototype built, but I want to build a revision two of it, and I need Charles's help. He's much better on the technical side, the testing side, than I am. So when he's available, we'll get that get going on version two of that. I hope to have the phono preamp out before Christmas. We're also started working on a phono on a, <laughs> on a headphone uh, amplifier. In fact, this morning I spent the whole morning with Charles talking about tubes for it, tube selection. And we've tightened up, I think we've got the power tube as we've decided upon it. We found a really nice Svetlana, a nice small um, beam powered tetrode that is new old stock, it's new new in the wrapper, NIW, <laughs> and uh, it's mil spec. And best of all, they're not expensive and they're available. Well, this is one of the big things that we do when we start to design a kit, a kit amp, a new kit amp, is I look for vintage, quality vintage tubes that are available and affordable. Because the supply of the more popular tubes, the high quality and more popular tubes, is getting tighter and tighter. So that's the thing we're doing all the time. And the the driver's driver tube, I think we've tightened up as well. But we'll talk about that when we get a little further along. Right now, Charles is going to have to is going to have to sketch the thing up. We're going to have to get um, our transformers in, and um, and get a prototype built. We're also working on two higher powered Class A monoblocks. So let's take a look at one of them. So this is the last working schematic for the URI monoblock. It's about as simple as you can get. A single triode stage as a driver using the lovely sounding World War II vintage CV6. The, the really rock solid, great sounding Russian 6P7S power tube. In all of my testing and prototyping, I've never damaged a 6P7S. I've never had one fail in service. They're just really great tubes. They sound good, they're rock solid, and they look great. So what more could you ask for? And they're affordable. So we just have a two tube per channel design. So what we've done is we're going to run the power tube in parallel. So let's, this is the first sketch. This is version one. So some things will probably change. Lots of things could change. We're basically going to take 
the driver stage of the URI and use it in what we're calling the URI times two or URI X2 design. Then we're going to take two of, the, two of the power tubes and parallel them. Now, when you parallel a power tube, you get double the current. And of course, when it comes to output, power tubes are current pushers. They're not voltage amplifiers. Driver tubes and preamp tubes, they amplify the voltage. Power tubes, they push the current. That's how you drive a loudspeaker. So we double the current. We have the output impedance, so that has to be taken into account with the output transformer, because we need to impedance match to get maximum power. But everything is paralleled. Look at the signal coming in here. It just comes straight into the grid. Hopefully we won't need grid stopper resistors. They, the URI itself, the little URI, doesn't. And hopefully in parallel we won't. I love, one of the things I do with design is I try to keep as much stuff out of the signal path as absolutely possible. I want as clean and clear a signal as possible. And anytime you put a component in, you actually degrade the sound. Now, sometimes you have to have a coupling capacitor or a resistor, and that's fine. But the fewer components, the better, in my opinion. So we also will couple the cathode together. This actually is just an extension across. It's not easy to connect them up with a drawing. So we share the same uh, cathode resistor and bypass capacitor. The plates are easy to see. We just take the high voltage through the primary side of the output transformer and it just goes straight onto both plates. You can see how they're tied together. Now, this tube is, is run in triode mode, class A triode. So to do that, you have to tie grid two. You have to tie the screen to the plate. Now, the maximum that the data sheet shows for G2 is 350 volts. Now, to get more power, you can double your tubes, but you can also bring your B plus up. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to bring the B plus up with a much larger power transformer, more current, of course. We're going to bring it up as high as we can. You need to drop a little bit of voltage going into G2. So I have to still determine what that resistor value will be. I want to come as close to 350 as I can. And that's all there is to it. So I'm at the point now where I just have to finalize the operating point for the driver tube. I've got to get a power transformer with the right voltage and current in, and then I'll start building the prototype. And we'll we'll talk about it as it as it develops. Okay, what came in this week? Well, some beautiful tubes. Hang on a second. And we're going to do a special sale. I should have said it at the beginning, but if you stay this long, stay till the end. So I got a bunch of RFTs in, which is really great. And I almost never get them in with the RFT label on. They're almost always relabeled, often Siemens, but many other two uh, manufacturers wanted uh, RFT LF34s. They're easy to tell apart, though, if they don't have a good label. They've got a little dimple, and they've got a little round bump where the pin goes into the base. These are wonderful sounding LF34s. They're very clean, clear sounding. In fact, they, they have the 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 cleanest sound of any EL34 I've ever heard, vintage or new. But with that clarity, you give up some of the warmth. There's there's no such thing as a free, free lunch when it comes to high-end audio. But if clarity is your thing, then you'll absolutely love these tubes. If you want a little bit more warmth, then the Mullard EL34 XF2s are the way to go. In my opinion, these are the Best sounding EL34 is ever made, in any quantity anyways. This is the single getter version. They made a double getter version. Nobody seems to know why at this, in the same production years, the same series, all XF2s in the 1960s up to about, we, from what somebody was telling me, that probably were made till about 1972. Um, 
But it's not easy to tell them apart because the production code for the year is a single digit. So um, we know they were made mostly in the 60s, but when you see a one digit, you don't know for sure if it's a 71 or a 61. So anyways, um, the single getter had a single getter had a big chrome dome and the double getter for some reason had a smaller chrome dome, which is backwards. It doesn't make any sense. Phillips, of course, owned Mullard and developed the L34 with Mullard. So it's not surprising a lot of the XF2s are branded Phillips. And here's another one, also a single getter, and it's branded Rogers. Rogers, of course, was a quality tube manufacturer based in Toronto. And um, originally, nobody could make EL34s. The patents were all locked up by Phillips and Mullard. So if you wanted an EL34 in your lineup of tubes, you had to buy from the Blackburn plant in England. And if you were big enough, uh, you would get your name on it, rebranded. And many of the tubes are branded RCA, Sylvania, Rogers, and quite a few of them are actually band branded for uh, amp manufacturers like Dynaco. A lot of EL34 XF2s are Dynaco branded, but the paint on all those tubes on the glass was so poor, almost none of it survives to this day. Anyways, I've actually in a situation where I've got more XF2s, XF2 Mullards in stock than I've ever had before. So we're going to run a Mullard sale. Why not? So the code is Mullard 100. Now the fun thing is there's some discount, half price discount quads in the store now. And the code will work on those as well as the full price um, regular quads of Mullards. And the discount quads are just testing a little bit lower than the premium quads. And as a result, you get them for half price. They've been electrically tested and they've been live tested and they sound great. There's really nothing wrong with them except they're just a little lower testing. And of course, I've got $20 flat rate shipping around the world. And if you're, you can't see it, but if your order's $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on, on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.